Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. Let's get started. Welcome to another technical talk episode at Mr. Carlson's Lab, where you get to listen to me ramble on about technical stuff. And this meter is very, very neat. So I have lots of these kind of hidden, I don't know what you would call them, interesting devices around. This one is very unique. You might already see why it's so incredibly unique. And usually what I do is, after a while, curiosity gets to me and I like to open these things up and take a look inside. So I figure, hey, why not uh, turn on the camera and share that experience with you and we can both see what's inside this thing together. So I've got my coffee. It's a stormy night over here and it's perfect time for us just to dig into something technical and, and see what's inside this really neat meter. So this meter, if you haven't noticed it already, is uh, called a Vomaster or VO Master, however you want to say that. It's made by Stark. Now, I've worked on Stark stuff before, and, uh, you know, Stark is kind of, uh, the quality that they put into some of the stuff I've worked on hasn't been all that great. But, you know, this looks like it's a copy, a very close copy internally to the Hickok 209A. So there's probably some trading or something going on between the two because they, they, they almost look identical. Now, what makes this thing so much different than most vacuum tube voltmeters, and I'll talk about why every bench should have one here in a moment, is that uh, this measures inductance and capacitance for a vacuum tube voltmeter. So for all of you that are familiar with vacuum tube voltmeters, I think it's pretty uncommon. It's got this neat looking probe and they're hiding a tube inside this. So we'll open that and take a look inside that probe too, big, huge probe. So the uh, so this uh, gives you dual functions. So it allows you to uh, probe AC with this and you can do it in cold weather because it warms your hands at the same time. And that's because of the vacuum tube inside there for all of you that didn't catch that pretty lame chunk of humor there. So anyways, I'll get a screwdriver here and let's open this thing up and see what's inside. This is going to eventually be a complete restoration. We'll go through this and align this, see how accurate this thing is. Uh, at this point, you know, I'm building lab number one and lab number two, and I'm actually building a third as well, which I've uh, talked a lot about and um, for all of you that are new here. So right now it's like I, I keep coming across these neat things and it's just like, you know what? I really want to see what's inside this. So let's, so let's do this together. All right, got my screwdriver handy here. Let's uh, see what's going on inside this. Of course, taking screws out isn't all that incredibly interesting, so I may just skip through a large portion of this. See how fast these come out. Coming out really fast. I could use my very, very fast uh, cordless screwdriver and zip these things out very quick, but I'm always scared that uh, with it moving fast, I'm going to slip off and hit the meter. The dial face on this, or the um, the meter cover, I guess you could call it, this plastic cover, looks like it has some scratches on it already. So I'll have to take some plastic polish to this, uh, to the meter face. So it usually requires removing the entire meter out of the whole thing and doing that. So uh, this is very common. If you have one of these meters and you're going to put it in storage, make sure that you put something soft over the face and don't put it up against a cardboard box or anything like that. Because if you're going to transport this, say you're moving it and it's up against a cardboard box, just the vibration of this thing shaking in your vehicle and this up against cardboard will just score this right up. Now, this is in pretty good condition. I don't know if I'll zoom in on this thing here. This is actually in pretty pretty good condition. You can see the scratches if I zoom in and I get the light on it just right. You know, you see up at the corners here and things like that. But all in all, it's not bad. I've seen these where they're just absolutely horrible. Uh, for example, the VTVM that I did that night uh, has got some just very, very deep, nasty scratches on it that just won't come out. So I have to wait to find another uh, cover for the meter in order to uh, to fix that up. Okay, so will this thing come out? I don't know what's gonna go on here. So I'll hold this, oh yes, it is loose. Okay, that's a good thing. It has that wonderful old com component smell to it. I really like that. And you know what? I'm gonna move my coffee right out of the way here because I wanna drink coffee, not crust. Okay, so. Is it catching on something here? I don't know. So there's a lot of room there. Oh, there it is. There it is. What's inside? Oh, look at this. 
Wow, that's pretty fancy for a... for an old meter. Wow, and it has that just wonderful old equipment smell. It's really nice. When this thing is operating, it'll have that smell. And uh, for all of you that are used to all of this brand new equipment, you know, brand new DMMs, you know, this uh, dead feeling equipment, this stuff is, when you're using this older equipment, it has personality and character to it. And again, for all of you that are, are new to this kind of stuff, it, when you start restoring this, if you ever get into this, you'll know what I mean. You'll be like, oh, that's what Mr. Carlson meant. So all of this stuff has has character to it. It just, you know, I can't tell you. Like some of the newer circuit boards, uh, they, you know, of course, they're, you know, they're completely, they, they, there's no, um, I don't know, you look at them, it's just a bunch of black blobs on it and that's it. And they hide firmware and that stuff. This stuff all just tells a story. You know, uh, even the older circuit boards. The older circuit boards had a kind of a weird smell to them. I never really liked that. Like that little transistor radio I worked on had that, uh, I don't know, just a really strange smell to it. I was never really, never really liked that. But um, at any rate, so we have a rectifier over here. Some of these uh, 6X5s were uh, known to short inside and destroy power transformers. So uh, I think it was uh, Zenith. It was either Zenith or Philco that put some light bulbs uh, in line with the plate leads. And uh, if anything shorted, the light bulbs would go away. A little bit of current limiting there as well. Uh, that's always a nice little uh, modification. I may do that. So we have a capacitor here. It looks like 10 microfarad at 450 volts. That would be a very easy replacement. Regulator tube. So I don't know what this is. What does it say on it? Is there anything on it? Let's see. Usually 100 and some odd volt regulators 150 volt something like that regulator 0 d3 yeah so regulator tube now these things don't have filaments inside them right so they just glow and a lot of people that are new to vacuum tubes they get confused by these things and they think that they're uh, gassy because uh, gassy tubes ha glow kind of a powdery blue color these things are supposed to do that uh, known as a cold cathode type tube so uh, you look through the top through the actual uh, mica spacer sometimes they have slots in them there it is. They just got slots in this one. Some of them don't. Some of them do. And uh, you'll see a, a powdery glow inside there. And um, they, uh, some of them are orange, uh, de depending on the gas that they put inside there. So very, uh, very nice looking tube in operation. So don't get confused by that. Of course, you see zero is the first one. So you know that there's no heater voltage, right? Zero as in no heater voltage, D3, right? So D factory marking three as in useful internal elements, if you prefer. Power transformer down here doesn't look cooked. Looks like it's actually in very good condition. Uh, looks to be like a, yeah, it is a 6SN7 down there in the bottom with a brown base on it. All you audio guys, just relax. Here we go. There it is. Um, looks like it's a military version. Let me see if I can get the focus on that a little bit better. Pardon the camera shaking here. Will it zoom in on that? It's trying to catch that there. Let's see if I can get down. There it is. Oh, it caught it. There it is. Yeah, it's the military version down in there. 6S and 7. So, what's this one? 6SJ7. Pentode. And uh, what's this one here? Oh, another 6X5. So it has both kinds in it. So one of these was really known to shorting. It, uh... So either this one or the other one, it might be that, I think this one here may be the newer design. So at any rate, one of them was known to short. I have some uh, 6X5s that are very, very short too. And uh, they're really common in the early pan adapters, like the uh, PCA 2T200 pan adapters had a couple of them in there. And um, yeah, they would uh, cook up the transformers. A lot of the old uh, audio amplifiers, like uh, Grom's amplifiers and things like that, they all had cooked audio transformers. So I've uh, worked on many of those audio amps in the past, and um, you have to find a replacement for it, which isn't too hard if you have an old RCA console around that doesn't mean too much to you. The transformers are almost identical. I'll uh, talk about that. I have uh, some Groms hiding in the back, so uh, still kicking about. So we'll uh, go through some of those too, maybe on another Tech Talk episode. So these caps need to be replaced. They have a wax coating on them, and uh, they're always always bad so they're always leaky 
So these will have to go to make this uh, thing dependable. And the batteries, they left the batteries in. And look at that. So a little bit of corrosion, right? You see a bit of corrosion happening here, right? And the uh, Radio Shack battery, which I don't know if it's, uh, could be carbon. Usually the carbon ones don't uh, destroy. Is it alkaline or is it uh, carbon? I can't tell. They don't destroy anything. So there's a little bit of corrosion, not bad. Uh, this is very easy to get rid of. I'm not worried about it. Uh, another word of advice, if you're gonna have one of these meters, you know, uh, distort or away for a while and say you're not gonna use it, you know you're not, take the batteries out of it because uh, this will happen. They, they all do that. Uh, carbon batteries are pretty good. You know, they're pretty decent for that, for uh, not destroying things, but um, it's always a good idea to get rid of all, all that stuff there. All right, let me get another meter in the uh, in the shot here, and we'll take a look at some of the values. It looks like they've got the uh, the early type roundies, which uh, are a little bit susceptible to moisture ingression. Here's an, a modern Allen Bradley style, but these are all the uh, roundies that let moisture in. So whether that's been replaced over time, it kind of looks like it may. Is uh, this is a newer one down here? Can you see that here? This one here is a newer one down here as well. Allen Bradley style and moisture ingression style. And uh, look at all these fancy resistors. Isn't that nice? Very nice. Okay, I'll be right back. All right, let's test some resistance values together. So this will give us an idea of what kind of an atmosphere this has been kept in, whether it's been in a damp garage or attic or whether it's been, you know, in a relatively stable atmosphere. Again, these things are, these roundy style resistors have a porous body on them and it allows moisture to get into the carbon plug. And then of course the carbon plug is in the center and what happens is the resistance values, they go high up. So let's see what this reads. Not bad, one meg ohm. So this is this is one meg, 20% tolerance. So there's no fourth band on this. And it's the same with this one here. So it's 20% tolerance and that'll settle off well within 20%. So that one's not bad. Let's check the second one here and see what it tells us. If I can get a, look at that. Under one meg ohm. So already you can kind of tell by the case, right? There's no rust on it and stuff. This has been, you know, in somebody's house or been in a shop for many, many years in a relatively a controlled atmosphere so so again in the future they kind of uh, they, they changed this design and went to this design up here where the body is smooth and it's sealed up so that no moisture can get inside so uh, they, they learned that over time so uh, putting this stuff in any type of equipment that would be mobile like a car radio or something like that ugh, man these things are all over the place so um, yeah. Oh, another thing that uh, you solid state people may want to know is that vacuum tube circuitry is uh, relatively high impedance or high resistance. And you can get away a lot of the time with testing the resistors right in circuit like I did. Now, this isn't so common with uh, solid state type of circuitry, you know, transistor type circuitry on circuit boards. Uh, you, you can get away with it in some cases, but um, mostly in all of this old vacuum tube gear, it's, uh, it's pretty easy going that way. Now, this doesn't uh, include leakage tests on capacitors. You have to remove one lead to test them for leakage just because the, uh, you know, the parallel resistance that you're looking for in a leaky capacitor is so incredibly high that anything in the circuit will load it down. So uh, that yeah, one end has to be opened here, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a little bit here. So let's test this one here. This is uh, 1.5 mega ohms, 20% tolerance. Let's see what this one is going to tell us. Uh, 1.7. Eh. Let's see what this one is doing. So this is 1.5 again. I get my make sure I'm not touching anything here. Not bad. Just about 1.5. Yeah. So that'll settle off well, close to its value. They're looking really, really good. So I can't foresee too much problems with the resistors in this circuit. Now, mind you, when I go about uh, restoring this thing, I'm most likely going to change a lot of these out with some very accurate, uh, very accurate resistors like these, the plate resistors on the 6SN7 here. I want these to be very accurate and stable. So I want this... Uh, I want this thing to be as good of a representation of how this thing would have operated back in the day as I can get it. So, and we'll compare this to other meters here. So now I have to tell you the looks of this thing is, you know, this is a pretty fantastic looking VTVM. In fact, I think this is one of the nicest looking VTVMs I've ever seen. 
Now, the functionality is a different thing. So if Hewlett Packard, all right, if Hewlett Packard would have made their 410B look like this, they would have had an absolute winner. Because you would have had the functionality. The 410B is going to have very, very high input resistance if you're measuring DC voltage. Like, it, like above 100 mega ohms. This will be lucky to be probably 10, 10 mega ohms. I don't know if this will measure this. So let's put this into a DC and we'll go down to the lowest scale here. So we would most likely be measuring AVC voltage at the 12 volt scale. So let's just see what happens here. Let's see what we're going to get here. Look at that, right? Right, we're looking at like 10 mega ohms input, right? So this would load an AVC circuit a little bit. Okay, so you'd you'd have to put like an active DC probe in front of this. But otherwise, it's a, you know it's a vacuum tube voltmeter and it does all of these other things. So as I say, like if if it had the functionality of the HP 410B, and you know if they made the 410B look like this is what I'm trying to say, they would have probably doubled their sales. Like this is such a fantastic looking meter. And with all of this extra, you know, with all the extra goodies that it has, capacity and, and inductance, I mean, what a fantastic looking meter. Whenever you're servicing a piece of equipment like this and you come across these wax capacitors, you just get rid of them, all right? You don't even think twice about it, unless of course they've been restuffed. And uh, what restuffed is, is uh, somebody's uh, taken these things out and they've spent a lot of time with them melting the wax off and they put a new capacitor inside and then they fill it with wax again to make the circuitry look original. And this is common in uh, some very collectible older radios. A lot of people will do that. They'll spend the time to do that. It is very time consuming and a little bit stinky. And, uh, but at any rate, you can, you know, make your old caps look like brand new ones again. And if you're very, very accurate. You'll even find the outside foil of your new capacitor and put it the right way around inside the shell. So I've designed test equipment that indicates the outside foil and uh, I've released some of that here on YouTube and I have some of the uh, pretty much a standalone device that you just put your fingers on and it tells you the outside foil that's released up on Patreon. So all the plans and designs are up there as well. So at any rate, this type of capacitor, you just replace with a, a newer poly style capacitor. Why do you replace these? Why don't you think twice? Well, these things are turning into resistors now. So what ends up happening inside this thing is this is a paper and foil style capacitor, right? So it's basically a piece of foil on a, on a piece of paper and then another piece of foil. And it's wound tight to get capacitance. You know, there's a, a long stretch of this stuff in there. Well, there's so much paper in there and it's going acidic at this time. What happens is, is it turns the capacitor into a resistor. So you're getting parallel resistance with this thing. And that's known as leakage. It's not physical leakage. It's called electrical leakage. And when people say leaky capacitors, they're not talking about anything dripping out of it. It's, it's, they mean electrically leaky. So you can picture this resistor, just take this resistor, for example, and place it across this. And that would be the failure point of this. Capacitors in a perfect world would look like an open connection. Well, we're not in a perfect world, right? But it would look like a completely open connection. It's not supposed to pass direct current at all. It's supposed to block the DC, but it's supposed to pass AC if you want to call it that, all right? Passing it. So that's the failure point of these things. And of course, finding the failure point in many different types of capacitors is you know, relatively simple. You could you know open one end up and take a, a everyday uh, leakage type tester that applies higher voltage and you can read that on an eye tube on the actual meter so they're still around now the, in order to put high voltage across these things you know that it is a, a little bit risky so what I've done is I have personally designed a piece of test equipment that does this at lower voltage now the way that a standard old capacitor tester works is in order to easily deflect the shadow angle inside a 6E5 vacuum tube or anything like that there needs to be a set amount of current to make that happen. Yeah, it's a vacuum tube, but it isn't all that incredibly sensitive, right? So what they do is they put you know, quite a bit of voltage across this, and then of course they're seeing the amount of current that's being drawn by the resistance, the, I guess you could call it the fictitious resistance that's across this, and that'll deflect the shadow angle inside the 6E5 or whatever type of vacuum tube that they're using. Well, the low voltage tester, what it does is it doesn't need to look at that resistance at such a high voltage because it's much more sensitive. It can look at the actual fictitious resistance at a much lower voltage and still detect it. 
And that's the reason I designed this device in the first place is because I was working on a transmitter that had some hiding problems and it was uh, a reoccurring problem and I needed to design my own piece of test equipment to find the issue, so I did. And uh, it worked so well that I released this to everybody in the uh, Patreon community. All the circuit boards and plans and everything is up there. So if you want to build one of these things, it's uh, you can check all that out. There's a whole bunch of different designs. Very easy through hole design to the one that you just saw, which is the most complex. And the most complex one is a double-sided board with uh, surface mount components on it. And I also show you how to build those boards right at your house. So I teach electronics on Patreon. So for those of you that don't know, at any rate, that's uh, it's all up there. So at any rate, getting back to this thing. So what's happening here is you would take these out and you would look for the outside foil end on these because it's usually marked by a band, which you can see here. And you take your brand new capacitor, which would be a poly style capacitor. At uh, I've done a lot of research on these as well. And I've, I've posted some verified components lists on Patreon as well that uh, show very good ones. I've, you know, I guess you could say... Um, given them a pretty definite hard test. <laughs> so uh, they've, they've stood through the test and uh, I felt confident uh, putting that in my verified components list. At any rate, so you take one of those capacitors, new, new capacitors, find out what side the foil is on, another tester that I've designed and created, and uh, put this in here properly. And then you do that with all of these wax capacitors and you'll end up with a very dependable device in the end. So uh, a lot of people seem to think that the outside foil doesn't matter in a lot of circuitry. Uh, yeah, it does. That's the reason they put those lines on the capacitors in the first place from the factory. Some circuits, it doesn't matter. All right. Some it doesn't. But in a lot of RF and oscillating circuits and things like that, and a screen grid bypass and things like that in some particular high sensitive circuitry, it is very important to... Uh, to have that foil side on the right side and keep the lead length as short as possible. I've seen some of these capacitors with braid coming out of them to lower the inductance. So I'll talk about that as well in the future. So stick around for more Tech Talk episodes. If you're new to this channel here, I'll cram your brains full of knowledge. So anyways, so that's uh, what you need to do with these things. You take these things out and just get rid of them. You know, you don't, don't waste your time with these things. Now, when I say get rid of them, you don't necessarily need to throw them in the garbage. You can put them in a bag because one day you might come across that radio. Say you're servicing a radio for somebody. Say you've gotten really good at this and now you're doing this and, and people are coming to you now. They're saying, hey, you know what? You're getting very good at what you're doing. I want you to maybe restore my radio, but I want it to look all original on the underside and I'm willing to pay for that. So what you do is you go, okay, you open it up and you find somebody's already been in there over time and they've done a butcher job on the thing. You can go to your bag of capacitors. You can pull wax caps out, restuff them, and put them in the radio and make it look like it was original. So whenever you take these caps out, put them in a bag and save them. Don't throw them away because one day, there's going to come that day you're going to go, ah, I've thrown all these out, you know, and somebody's going to be willing to pay big dollars to have their radio look, you know, and, and perform the way that it should, right? So anyways, just some tips that you might come across. The line cord on this thing is looking a little bit sketchy. You know, it's it's been replaced over time. Glob of tape here. Things like that. Uh, the, this capacitor ties to the chassis through a mica style capacitor here. It is on the neutral line, right? White is neutral, black is hot if the plug is wired correctly. So it is on the neutral line to the chassis. And we also have a safety ground of the chassis. So I would still get rid of this and I would still put an XY rated type capacitor in here. Those are safety capacitors and they're designed to fail in a certain condition. So that way uh, you don't have a harm, harmful situation. So uh, XY rated safety capacitors are a really good idea now for anything that you're working on where they have a portion of the line tied to the chassis. Remember, not all houses are wired correctly. Okay. So if your house is wired incorrectly and you know say something like this was in here and it didn't have a ground connection uh, you know it can make the case of this thing kind of hot for all of you that have worked on these things before and you've rubbed your hand on the case and it feels like it's buzzing as you rub your hand on the case of the of a meter or or an older piece of equipment so you're just sitting there and you just touch the case and it feels like a buzzing sensation well you know what that buzzing sensation is right you're isolated, you're not making a circuit, but you're feeling the AC on the case. So uh, for all of you that are older techs, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm really looking forward to the restoration of this meter. It's such a great looking device. And of course, I'll take all of you along on that adventure with me. We'll calibrate it together and see how well it performs, how accurate it is. 
So again, you know, it looks uh, much like a Hickok design, so it's got to be good. Let's take a look inside this probe. This is a neat looking probe. Let's open this thing up. So this is an AC probe, so there's a tube in here, and since it's an AC probe, that's most likely going to be some form of rectifier or something like that. So, let's see if uh, let's see if I'm correct. I imagine it probably is. It's pretty standard for all these types of probes. So if this was to be for a spectrum analyzer, it would most likely be a cathode follower. So like a 6C4, some high frequency triode. Since this is an AC probe, I'm thinking a diode of some sort. So there's so many different diodes out there, who knows which one it is. And I would say a 6AL5. So let's see. It has a, uh, looks like it has a European number on here, European vacuum tube designation, England, yep. Yeah. So that looks like a 6AL5 to me. So is, does that mean that I've been working with tubes too long that I can actually look at the internal structure and just tell what type of a tube it is? Now, mind you, it could be a 12AL5, right? You can't tell a heater voltage, but still, that's just the heater voltage. So anyways, it's a double diode. So it's a diode here, a shield in the center, and then another diode on this side, right? Nice, good getter compound in there. Probably has a lot of life left in it. So we'll test that out and see how well that works in the end. Black tape on the bottom. Five conductor cable, most likely. Yes, four, one, two, three, four, and a shield. So it looks like it's uh, seen better days. That can all be cleaned up. Why there's tape down here, I don't know. It doesn't look like anything would touch the shell. It has a ground here to keep the shell grounded, so it keeps the noise from your hand out of the circuit. Very important. And this is just a strain relief, so you don't pull the cord out. Just a little wire wrapping material here. So uh, stop pulling this out. So usually wax coated string is really what that is. So that's what they used to do. Now you'd have a nylon a tie strap or zap strap, I call them, zip, and then you would use that. So I might replace that with that because you know we're gonna have to take this thing all apart and clean this all up and make sure all the values, I don't know what's under the tape, we'll save that for the restoration and uh, find out what's there at that time. So there you go. That's pretty, uh, pretty common for uh, any type of uh, a probe like this. The uh, Hewlett-Packard has a diode in it as well, but it'll measure beyond 600 megacycles or megahertz, if you like, in modern speak. Well, yeah. what, what's a megacycle? So it's, uh, okay, megahertz, if you like. And uh, then you can really trick if you're uh, an engineer and you go to work and somebody has something that works in the gigahertz, you can call it, uh, say it's 2.5 gigahertz, you can call it 2.5 kilo megacycles, and they'll be like, what? And you'll be like, what, don't you know what a kilo megacycle is? You know, so that's how they used to name it. They used to call them kilo megacycles. I have a spectrum analyzer from 1950 that goes to 40 gigahertz, so, or 40 kilo megacycles, if you like. So, anyways, there you go. Trick some of your fancy fandangled uh, engineers that sit beside you and say these things and they'll be like, what, what are you talking about? And then what you're going to do eventually is, but then you're just going to give it away that you watch Mr. Carlson's lab. You'll come into work with one of these things and put it on the bench and say, I'm, I'm using this. I'm sick and tired of this lifeless stuff. I need to have something that looks neat and use this on the bench. And then you'll say, hey, you want to try it? And the engineer beside you will go, uh, 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 how, how do I how do I use this? And you'll be like, what? You don't know how to use this stuff? This is ancient. You should know how to use this stuff. And the, your fellow engineer will go, can you show me? So there you go. And then you, you'll be the star of the day. So I have lots of stories about that. I used to bring uh, some pretty interesting pieces of test equipment, uh, test equipment with me in, uh, did I say test equipment? Wow. Test equipment with me uh, back in the day when I uh, was reverse engineering electronic devices. And uh, just for the fun of it, because once you do this for a long period of time, you reverse engineer things, it's uh, yawn, right? You know, so just like everything else, you do anything in excess and it's yawn. So in order to spice the time up, I would bring in pieces of test equipment and use that to make the day more interesting. And um, 
yeah, so I would bring in things like this and everybody would come over and look at it and go, what is this? How does this work? So uh, you'll be the star of the show if you do that, let me tell you. Anyways, hope you enjoyed this and I'll have a lot more Tech Talk episodes for you in the future. If you learned something today, let me know in the comments below and uh, I'll share as much knowledge with you as I absolutely can in the future. So stay tuned and definitely if you haven't subscribed, subscribe and hit the bell. I'll see you guys later. See you all later. Take care. Bye for now. If you're enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronic devices alike. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. If you'd like to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap the bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal electronic inventions and designs, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the show more tab below the video's description and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.